Hey, thank you for joining us. My name is Caleb Sneed. I do sales and marketing here at Wolf Industries, and I wanted to uh, extend greetings um, and say thank you for joining us. This is Wolf Monthly number five. We've been doing the monthly format since June, and uh, we're, we've been real excited. We're excited about the topic that we're going to go over today. Um, I do want to mention real quick um, that we will not be having a stream in November, and I'll talk about this again at the end, um, but we have one more uh, monthly live stream by the end of the year. Um, so we're going to jump in today. We got this, uh, we got this question a few, few months back, I want to say probably two months back, um, that we're going to go over today specifically about expanding your customer base into other businesses. And um, so we have a lot of examples here to show today. Um, a little housekeeping on the chat. Uh, Bill Pierce is usually in the chat and he's, you know, throwing in model numbers and, and pricing and all that. Um, he's actually here with us today and he's going to be part of the presentation. Um, so we've got Dan in the chat. He's got the, uh, the model numbers that he'll be able to, to put up. And I will uh, be monitoring the chat on my cell phone. And then we will be able to answer any questions, um, and I will forward those on to, to Bill and Glenn as they go through. Um, I think that's all to get started. Um, I'll be back here at the end, and we'll go over a little bit of what uh, our live stream is going to look like going forward uh, into the end of the year. Um, and so let's jump right into it. All right. Thanks, Caleb. Thanks, Caleb. As Caleb mentioned, I'm Bill Pierce. I'm the Vice President of Business Development here at Wolf. And... Y'all know Glenn, he's here just about every month, and this feels kind of familiar, but it's been a yeah. long time. Too long. The Too uh, long. Glenn and I work together at the shows that we do, uh, which doing sharpener training, and we have not done one since early February. That was actually the last plane trip I took in the middle of all this pandemic stuff. Yeah. Um, in almost 19 years here with Wolf, I've never been home this for this long a spell. <laughs> so this feels familiar, but looking at the camera makes it quite interesting. Um, we are going to cover several different things today, talking about expanding into some other businesses. Um, some of that plays into other topics that we're going to cover. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about some medical scissors and do some tips and tricks on that and show some demonstration. Um, one of the tools we use on that are the diamond wheels. So we are going to talk about uh, diamond wheels and some of the differences and the maintenance. We're going to talk about some helpful accessories that go with uh, the medical field and doing some of these different scissors. And then we're gonna wrap up with a quick discussion on the B2B customer. Uh, expanding your business, looking outside of your normal comfort zone, getting the blinders off to see what else is out there uh, so that you can either bring your route in tighter or that you can expand uh, the business that you have and grow your sales and the pricing. So uh, we're gonna turn it over to Glenn and he's gonna start us off with a discussion about diamond wheels. Uh, and the differences and uh, talk about the wheels we use here on our machines and equipment. Thanks, Bill. I get a call out of questions, uh, you know, which works better, the standard sharpening wheel or the diamond wheel? Can you use the diamond wheel to sharpen uh, the industrial type of shears? And yes, you can. Um, my, my typical uh, caveat to that answer is but you may not want to because your diamond wheel, the 800 grit at least, is over $200 to replace where your standard sharpening wheel is $30 to replace. Uh, do you want to be putting that type of, of wear and tear on the diamond wheel? Uh, it'll, be, it'll work, but um, you know, just look at the cost effectiveness of how much uh, wear and tear you're putting on your diamond wheel as opposed to um, having a maybe a second second machine with a standard sharpening wheel. When I was mobile, I had a machine set up with the Economy Gold and a machine set up with a professional twice as sharp. And uh, my, my diamond wheels lasted much longer. That being said, the differences between our, uh, our 800 or our 240, 400, 600, 800 grit diamond wheels and our corrugating wheel is that the corrugating wheel is electroplated. It's a plated diamond. It's a single layer of abrasive. It's very hard. Uh, it lasts a long time. The, the downside of this and why the, the other wheels are, are not plated is that a plated wheel generates much more heat 
Uh, we don't see any bad effects because with the corrugating wheel, because we're dealing with such a very thin, uh, thin section of your cutting edge and the teeth are just, it's cutting such a small area, it doesn't cause a lot of damage as far as heat is concerned to the, to the edge. The resin bond diamond wheels are, uh, the, the reason they, they go with a resin bond is that you're able to get much more abrasive throughout the entire uh, life and body of the, the, the resin. It contains the abrasive for you. But it also, as it wears, it, it opens up, it, they call it um, uh, sharpening itself. All you're doing is exposing fresh diamond as it as the wheel wears. And so it, it lasts much longer. It's much more uh, efficient. And uh, it actually cuts much, much cooler. Uh, when used properly, you can barely tell that the shear is getting warm. Um, the resin works very, very well. Uh, if you are uh, looking at using a diamond wheel for industrial shears, and you know, we're going to be looking at the, uh, the medical shears here, uh, you may want to go to a 600 or 400 grit. You'll find that some of these uh, shears have a lot of damage in them. Um, just by nature of cutting, I had a doctor that would cut casts and that, uh, that had a lot of fiberglass in some of the layers and uh, it, a lot of wear and tear on these. This is a, typically a much softer shear. So you're going you're gonna to require a more uh, abrasive uh, wheel if you're going to go with the diamond wheel. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't use the 800 grit. Uh, it'll just take a little longer to get that, that damage off. Um, that being said, uh, we're going to look at sharpening these medical shears. We've got some that are uh, very unique in their shape, small in size. Um, the, uh, the clamping, uh, some look real familiar, just basic shear. Something that you're going to find in this particular industry is that we're not looking at steep angles like a 35 or 45 or 55. This, uh, most of these shears up here are at zero. And that may come to a shock to some of you, but uh, it's, it seems to work the best. Uh, a lot of these, uh, you just have to, you can use a standard clamp. I've got a narrow clamp up here for sharpening these very uniquely shaped shears. I'm going to say so before yeah. we sharpen that, let's go ahead and, oh. uh, and see what we've got here. <laughs> this is, and this is typical. You see that? We're trying to cut gauze, which is, this is a gauze, this is a banded shear that he's got, and it's not cutting at all. Zero. You can imagine being the frustration of working in a medical office and having your scissor failing like that. You can understand the frustration of being a patient and having somebody hack at the bandage over your wound and have it not come off. One thing, when I first started with Wolf and I started working with these scissors, I was alarmed when I found how low the angles were. Uh, Glenn is not kidding when he says that they are at zero and five degrees at times. Um, I didn't know that until I actually went into a laboratory facility and looked at them all and thought they had ruined all their scissors. Hmm. They hadn't. They had simply sharpened at the factory edge. So these are, while they scissor, the scissor action is very familiar, they are a very different tool than a beauty shear, um, a grooming shear, and an industrial shear. So be aware of that. These, these were shears that somebody actually uh, gave to us to sharpen just for this class. And you can see the damage and this is just blade to blade they're typically cutting cloth only like those bandages a lot of inside line damage so this has to be taken off to do that you're going to need a very coarse wheel 
You can see where I'm clamping here. It's just to make sure I can get the shear open enough to get to the wheel. Now, if I can't get all the way in, you'll either have to take that outer cover off or find another place to clamp it. Looks good. And Glenn, I noticed you are using the twice as sharp on this one versus the diamond wheel we talked about. Uh, is that because of the damage on there? Yes, it's, it's because there was so much damage on this particular shear. Now, I sharpened both blades. I'm going to just spread to close, press to open. So you are going to bring up a burr just like all the other scissors. It'll be a very small burr because the closer you get to zero, the uh, the less of a burr you're going to bring up. I'm going to take it across the hone one time, real light. Close the shear, and I'll do the same thing here. So you're you're running the hone but you're not polishing as extensively as you would on an industrial shear or a beauty scissor. I don't want to have a real high polish on this. This is this needs you know, one of our favorite terms, like you said, you want tooth to this. Now, if you want to fold it into, there's two layers, four layers. He's getting a little close there, making me nervous. <laughs> okay. So it's... We're looking at about almost 10 layers there, and now it's starting to struggle. But up to eight layers, we're getting a very good clean cut. We wouldn't even cut a single layer when we started. The rest of these, are you, you're going to find are like a, any kind of a standard industrial shear. Um, this actually has a nice little curved blade to it. Now, because this is so thin, so small, I may want to go to my my diamond wheel with this. Daniel, do I need to move this? I won't say, why don't we swap to the machines? Down? Yep. I'll just move this one back. Okay. And you'll note again, that's How's a neat that? Just like a small embroidery scissor, um, with the medical shears and scissors, sometimes you have to find an alternate place to clamp. They're, they're twisty, they've got bends, they've got funny angles. Uh, you may have to experiment a little bit to get to a place so that you can get the blade in properly. This being a curved shear, I've got my cutting edge at a slight angle so that my angles match all the way across the blade. What kind of pressure are you using on the wheel right now, Glenn? Very, very light. Okay. Very light. Um, this particular shear has got a slight bit of damage on the tip. And so it would either have to be re-tipped. Now I'm going to spread to close, press to open this one as well. But I'm just going to go back to the diamond wheel, do a one light pass. Cut that burr off. Oops, the other direction.
Now we forgot to do a test cut with this to show the improvement. Another thing I'm going to do the well, we have got it. I want to make sure my tips are the same length. This is a little bit off. So just like with standard scissors, if points don't match, they cannot cut. They'll, uh, it'll present a, a slight hazard when they are cutting. But yeah, they, it may catch or tear at that tip. You notice one blade is much thicker than the other. Front down. Yeah, we brought some latex material. And the, the latex is a close simulation to skin. These scissors that he has are for cutting tissue. The others are used for cutting bandages. Um, latex, it's not a, a perfect example of uh, are tissue. Are able to see that real well, Dan? But okay. it's, a, it's a great stand-in for skin, and that's what these scissors are going to be cutting. This particular shear was uh, sent to us. Um, we've got a drawer full of them. But they're, uh, they're unique in a couple of ways. One, the, just how the, the handle, the blade is shaped. And the other one is this has a very, very coarse corrugation on one blade. And you could either use the, the coarse corrugating file or you'd have to purchase a coarse wheel. I'm going to test that first. This actually cuts pretty good. <laughs> okay. Okay. But I'm just going to show you a, a different. This is the narrow clamp. And you are actually able to get. Onto the blade. With this. So the narrow clamp isn't necessarily required, but it can be helpful and finding a good place to clamp so exactly. that you can get to that angle. Exactly. Otherwise, I'd have to clamp out here on the handle mm -hmm. and try and make that work. Yeah. And in that particular pair, that can be pretty dicey uh, with all the twists and turns it has. It can. I'm coming close to the handle, close to the table. Now, because it was cut so well, all I'm going to do is cut that 800 grit burr off and then sharpen the second blade. So again, we're not polishing the edges because that can cause slip. Yeah, I, mentioned, I mentioned being in that lab, the first time I sharpened medical scissors, I put a polished edge on there and I got in trouble because they would not cut well. Everything was sliding. Uh, as before, it was cutting fairly decently, and uh, I just wanted to show you, you there's going to be times when you may need a narrow clamp for this. Um, do you want me to do the rest of them? No, we can, we'll, we'll talk about the fact that this is a thicker blade, but certainly this is going to be cutting tissue as well. If when you're dealing with medical scissors, if you see something like this with a tip, that's going to be generally used for bandages. But the angles are very similar. What they're cutting is different. That's why we would test this on gauze. We would test the rest of these scissors that are going to cut tissue on latex. A latex glove would work. Yes. Um, so be sure and be sure and talk to the technician at the vet office, at the uh, the doctor's office. What are these used for? What are they cutting with them? Um, sometimes they are going to use scissors and abuse them. They may try to cut cast with that. And that's a good opportunity for you to say, you know what? We have better scissors to cut casting material. Yes. We have industrial scissors. You can blunt an ed, blunt, or blunt a tip on something and give them uh, something that will work a whole lot better than a, a little bandage shear to do some heavy-duty cutting. Um, so we've sharpened on the diamond wheel. Go ahead, Glenn. Well, this particular shear is made in Pakistan. Um, it's typically going to be a, a softer alloy, softer material, and if you're using your diamond wheel, it's going to load up the diamond. 
it's going to uh, impact that metal into the, the, the diamond that's exposed on the bond. If that happens, it's going to generate more heat just because the diamond isn't allowed to cut. You're just rubbing metal against metal. That's why we have the diamond cleaning stick. Now, they're both white. They're both about three inches long. One's half by half, and the other is a very smooth, about half by one quarter. This has a little coarse texture to it. It's what's called friable. In other words, this is gonna break down. Uh, it's meant to take the metal out of the diamond and just throw it out. You don't use it like a dressing brick. This is your dressing brick designed for your standard sharpening wheel. Do you, ever, do you ever want to use that on your diamond wheel? No. Do not use this on the diamond wheel. Do not use your honing sticks on the diamond wheel. It won't turn out well. Uh, your diamond is going to uh, remove a lot of this. It's going to create a lot of heat. Uh, this is a resin bond. Uh, if you are creating too much heat, you will smell it. It's a very good indicator that you know, you, you're either doing the wrong thing or your diamond needs cleaned out. When you start smelling that resin uh, coming off, this is going to create its own unique uh, odor, but uh, the way you're going to use this is like a pencil eraser, okay? Light pressure, just back and forth, and I'll show you the end of the stick. It's nice and clean, square, brand new, and we'll have to take this out of inventory. And what kind of pressure are you using, Glenn? Light pressure. Okay. It's, Light is always best. It's almost inaudible here compared to other work that's done. And as he mentioned, that's pulling the metal out of the cutting surface so it can cut cleaner and cooler. But we want to stress, please don't mix up the diamond cleaning stick with the other hones and dressing bricks. That's right. If you make that error, that's a $200 plus error. <laughs> uh, we really don't want to do that. I don't laugh at the sharpener that does that. I laugh because I've done it and it's not fun. <laughs> now, if you can see, our standard sharpening wheel is loaded up and I'm gonna clean it with the dressing brick is used just a little bit differently. I'm going to tip this corner. My finger is going to represent this lower finger guard. And so I'm going to lay this corner on the, on the finger guard and just rotate like a windshield wiper. And I'm going to be using this top corner just about that much on the wheel. Okay. Wonder. If it would you need me to hold something the machine okay Don't get in here and again light pressure you can always take more off but we have not found a way to put more on yet And I always like chamfering my edges a little bit, just in case I run my finger into them and it doesn't, it'll prevent it from cutting it too much. <laughs> it'll burn. Thank you, Bill. Okay. So to recap, I guess if we can come back to the wide, the wide angle, we have our ceramic cone, and our pink cone, these are for deburring and working nicks out of the inside blades of scissors. Don't confuse those with the diamond cleaning stick. This is the only thing we recommend to use on your diamond wheel. Yes. Otherwise, it's a 200 and something dollar mistake. This is the gray dressing brick we used on the 27,000 standard sharpening wheel. So make sure that you keep those separate. If you have any questions, give us a call uh, before you dress.
Uh, we'd love to, while we love to sell you wheels, <laughs> we'd rather sell you a wheel that you've used up and yes. not one that you've ruined. Okay. Um, a couple other things. Uh, we thank you for that on dealing with the medical scissors. A couple things that Glenn used and that are helpful. One, he talked about the narrow clamp. You can see here the jaw has a cutout so that you can grab a hold of those small edges and small blades. This one works almost 99% of the time. Yeah. This one can make life easier, can speed up your process, can be a little more secure and offer you a way to clamp on some of those real curved, uh, interesting bended scissors. Um, some other of the accessories that can be very helpful on these small scissors and scissors in general, light and magnification are huge when you are sharpening. If you can't see it, uh, then how do you know that you're getting the damage out? So some tools that we have here, we have a magnifocuser. It looks very similar to what a jeweler might wear over his head. This slides up and down. Uh, this works fairly well, but we also have light source, and this is just one light source. Whatever light source you have, you want to make sure you have plenty of light in the right spot. It doesn't do a lot of good to light up your entire van or your whole work area with uh, you know thousands and thousands of lumens when you really need it over the machine. This gooseneck lamp made by Moffitt is uh, got a stud mount package. It clamps onto the back of the machine. You can also put the stud mount onto your workbench and clamp it on there. It does run off of a different power source, so you'll need to plug it in. Glenn, if you'll go ahead and... But that will fit on the machine. Wherever you put the stud mount package, it will lock in place. So you have a light source over your machine. Again, runs off of a separate power source, but you have this. Another thing that can be very important is magnification. We have the same gooseneck style here a dual lens magnifier. Now this can get a little cumbersome mounting two of these on your machine, especially if you're portable. This can also mount on your workbench and leave it there if you'd like to. A few years ago they came out with a shade mount design. We have this in single lens and dual lens and this simply opens up here and mounts to the shade of your light source. So in one shot, you've got light and magnification. It's got an insert here. This is two time power, this is four time power, and does a very good job of highlighting your edge so that you can see it. Um, let's be realistic. Some of us that are a little grayer of hair than others, magnification is uh, very necessary. We have to be able to see. One of the biggest things I see when I'm in industry is there's not proper light in the sharpening room. They can't see what they're doing. They can't see the damage. So they end up putting scissors through a process that really didn't do much for them because they can't see the damage that they're taking off. So, uh, so those are some of the accessories that are helpful in doing some of the medical scissors. And when we say medical, we're talking about veterinarians, we're talking about dentists, we're talking about uh, the medical field, and that can be wide open. There's lots of places out there uh, which brings us to the topic, as Glenn's mentioned, he, he sharpened on the road for years, and we've talked about the different things that we have found out there, <laughs> and you never know what you're going to find. Um, one thing I encourage people to do is, unless you have enough business, um, unless you have enough time in the day, uh, you always need to take a look around and see what's yes. there. Um, when you're pulling up to a groomer, stop and take a look at the rest of that strip mall. If there's somebody doing uh, a laundromat there, if there's somebody doing uh, alterations, yep. even a cigar store, there may be a chance to sharpen. And you can do that right there without any, any more travel time, no more wear and tear on your vehicle, and no more gas consumption. Yep. Yes, these things, you're not going to get uh, paid as much as you do a beauty scissor. Uh, yep. There's some people out there, I call them beauty scissor snobs. You know, Take that with a little bit of love, where it's beauty scissors, beauty scissors, beauty scissors, because I can make $30, $35 a pair on the beauty scissors, and that sounds really attractive. But if I'm going to drive 20 minutes to go get more beauty scissors, could I make up just as much money right here and not spend any more money to go get it? 
Uh, some of these B2B opportunities, as I, I mentioned, that's Dennis Medical. Uh, you go to the beauty salon, you visit the ladies there, the gentlemen there that are cutting hair, the barbershop, take a step back and take a look. What other potentials are there? Glenn and I just the other day got blades in from a <laughs> box style cigar cutter. They retail for about $80, 80 to $100. This one had been rendered useless because of the dull blades. Uh, Glenn and I took a look at it. Uh, I, of course, gave it to Glenn. I said we would sharpen it. We is French for Glenn uh, in my book. Um, take a look at it. And he spent a few minutes. We did a little research. We sharpened them. Easily a $20 to $25 job at the lower part. And that machine is now working better than brand new. So the customer is thrilled. His $80 yeah. machine is working. He's able to serve his customers. I personally never would have thought about going to a cigar place yeah, to do sharpening. That's exactly right. Not going to be maybe as frequent as scissors, but if that was at the end of that strip mall where you were, you could have picked up $20, $25 in about 10 minutes, um, and you could do that a couple times a year, and you don't have to go any further to get it. Something else I found, Bill, was your industrial sure customers need you more frequently than the beautician does. Yes. So maybe you're only charging $15 and you're going to see them once a month mm -hmm. where that beautician, you're charging her 30 and you're going to see her once a quarter. Correct. So just, just be thinking about these people. Um, I had automotive upholsters. I had auto, automotive restores, uh, sign and awning shops. I had uh, draperies. I had uh, quilt shops, uh, Joanne Fabrics. Um, I've talked with uh, several sharpeners that go to the farmer's markets and just set up a booth and they do very, very well, just sharpening scissors and knives, so. Yeah, think outside that box. I know oh, up, yeah. in, uh, up in Michigan and some places up north, they actually make air conditioner covers so that they can cover the air conditioner and keep the snow and all of that out of it. Yep. That's an industrial application. Uh, you know, small uh, food service operations could have scissors that could need yep. to be sharpened. Um, yep. People, pool covers. If there's people out there using scissors as a serious tool, especially those places that have four or five employees, that's a great place for a mobile sharpener to go visit. Yep. And they're out there. Um, if you'll email me, bill at wolfind.com, we have a list of uh, the types of industries that use these scissors that would be a good place to go investigate and check into yes. that would be right in that sweet spot of four to eight employees in a lot of cases um, that a mobile sharpener could go make some extra money. And again, yes, uh, beauty shears, you get more per unit, but you don't visit them as often. So if you could sharpen one beauty scissor for $35, or go sharpen four or five industrial scissors for the same amount of time and work and effort, you can see that you're actually better off with the with the industrial. Yes. Um, so keep those eyes open. Take a look around, especially now as you know what new what norm is there. It's all a new norm. We're resetting everything. Um, and as you work with the the business to business, some ways to get in there. That's that can be a little bit tough. You walk up and you don't know who to talk to. You don't know these people. Um, there's a lot of different ways to get that going. You may want to do some online research. Make yourself familiar with what it is they do. Yes. Maybe some of the key people. Now, please do not try to pass off that you have some type of relationship with the owner of the company. That can blow up in your face very quickly. Just ask some of the people that have called and tried it at Wolf Industries. <laughs> Doesn't go well. But you do want to get to know them. Let them know what it is you do. You may hear no the first time. You may hear no the first three or four times. But no is our second favorite answer. Because eventually, when they need you, That's if right. your name's in front of them, That's right. they're going to say yes. Um, and there will be a need that comes up. You don't know when it's going to happen. So don't give up on them. Talk to the people up front and be pleasant with them. That gatekeeper has a tough job. The first person you meet that has to deal with everybody that walks into a place, be nice to them, be polite to them, ask them a little information, drop off a roll of lifesavers or some candy to that person, depending on the size. Um, but do your homework. The same with uh, the medical. Um, you know, Find out who the office manager is. 
Think about when's a good time to talk with that person. Friday afternoon, three o'clock, do not go talk to a medical office. Hmm. They're trying their best to get out there. Monday morning, nine o'clock, you say early bird gets the worm. Well, everybody that's been sick all weekend or every dog that's been sick all weekend is now at that doctor's office or at that vet's office trying to get fixed up. It might be for a medical professional Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it is a good time. Maybe a lull, maybe talk with them, do a little phone work ahead of time. Um, just the way you like to be treated as a business customer, uh, when people deal with you, turn that around and put that to the other, to B2Bs. You don't have to do anything fancy or catchy, and we all like our, you know, our little slogans and all that. I found the best way to approach it is education. That's how I've sold for Wolf Industries for going on 19 years now. That's how I approach it with you, the sharpener, is you have a question or even I perceive that you have a question. You may not even know it yet. I simply educate, yep. give an answer. Here's a solution that I have for you, and it tends to go pretty well. This will open up doors for uh, industrial share sales as well. Um, you know, you... If your focus is on, has been on at beauty shares or beauty salons, you should be selling shares. Uh, it's foolish of you not to. But you start getting into these industrial places, and even a, a place that sells scissors, I think of a, a cloth, uh, like it was like, it was similar to, it was a Hamrix. And they sold all, a huge line of, of uh, Fiskars. But I walked in there with a Kai shear, and there wasn't an employee there that used Fiskars because <laughs> they were all using the Kai shears. And all they were doing is slide cutting, uh, just selling fabric. But the Fiskars wouldn't do it. So uh, look, look to expand your business in the sales department as well. Yep. Keep that eye out. Don't push too hard. Um, we had a gentleman just last week that came in and uh, he had a service that he wanted to sell to us and he literally would not take no for an answer. And he risked being removed from the premises. <laughs> um, I'm not making this up. He just couldn't push. He couldn't understand why we didn't want was he, what he was selling. Hmm. And the fact was it wasn't a good fit and it wasn't a time for us. So be sensitive to those cues. Be, you know, can't stress enough, be polite. And, yes. and go in there, but keep the eyes open, expand on it. Um, you know, you find something great, you can share it or you can keep it a secret so that you're the only one that knows it. it depends on if you want to teach or if you want to keep sharpening uh, for that place just for you. Um, but uh, let us know if you have any questions. Again, email me. I'll be glad to share that list with you. Think in terms of are they cutting and are they using scissors? If they're using scissors, they need you. Yes. We're going to turn it back over to Caleb now, and he's going to do some wrap-up for us. Thank you. All right. So I noticed that the the stream is actually a few minutes behind where we're at here in the office. So I'm going to hang out for just a little bit and see if there's any more questions that are coming through. Um, but while we are here, um, you, Glenn, you talked about some, you gave some kind of generalization on what uh, a sharpener can expect to charge for beauty scissors. You said 30, 35 to the 40. Um, you mentioned industrial. Uh, specifically, the question is, what, what's the general price that you may can expect uh, with these medical scissors? There's a couple ways to look at your, your pricing. Um, one, if you're looking, focusing on what to tell the customer without knowing what their product costs, um, so if you're looking at your own time, you've got to determine what your time is worth. So if you look at this particular pair of shears and think, okay, this is going to take me maybe two or three minutes to sharpen and you want to make 60 to $120 an hour, then that shear is going to take, it's going to cost you two or three, four minutes to sharpen that particular shear. That's gonna be two or three, four dollars. That's just the cost. Now you've gotta make your profit. You've gotta pay for, um, you know, it, as far as your, your profit's gonna to have to cover your fuel, it's gonna to have to cover your insurance, it's gonna to have to cover your groceries, your, your budget, okay? 
so that's got to play into your pricing as far as what your time is worth. Uh, if, if I were to go out, see, 20 years ago, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I was charging, uh, if I didn't have to take the share apart, I'd charge 10 to $15. But that was 20 years ago. And so with inflation since then, I mean, I should be charging technically about $30 for those, but they could probably buy three or four new ones at that price. So you're going to have to gauge, you know, is it economical for them to buy a new product or for you to service that product? So that's going to have to play into, you know, what, what you're going to charge. Uh, as far as beauticians, I tell the guys, what are they charging for a lady's haircut? If they can, if they're charging that, that's a particular price that they're going to be comfortable with you charging them to sharpen their beauty shears. Uh, if an industrial shear costs $80, uh, sharpen it. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I go this direction with the round blades. Uh, if, if that round blade is $50 to that particular individual, uh, don't feel, you know, too bad charging a third or half that price uh, because you're going to sharpen that and it's, it's going to save them money. Um, you know, when I was doing um, the medical shears for the people that did the cast, they were podiatrists, um, got that uh, contact because the secretary happened to be in a salon chair when I'm sharpening the beautician's chair. Can I have your card? Sure. And I get this call from a doctor and I went in there and they had a box like this of industrial shears all gummed up and, and they said, how much are you going to charge for us to do these? And I figured, you know what? They're doing one particular task with these. I'm going to sharpen them all at the exact same angle. So I didn't have to go through and take the time to test angles and, and scratch test and all this. I sharpened everything at the exact same angle. And so instead of charging 10, I charged them five because I had literally over a hundred shears in there and I wasn't going to take any time to, and I just went through them, test cut on cloth and I made money on that. It was, it was a good, it was good for me to do that price cut. So volume is going to affect the price that you're going to give. Um, so I hope that helps you determine uh, what you're going to sell. The biggest thing is don't undersell your time, please. Uh, don't go in there and say, hey, I'll do one for free. No, you're, you're better than that. All right. You're building a business. We don't have people don't come into Wolf Industries and say, hey, can you do these for free? And I'll see if I'm going to use you again. No, it doesn't work like that. This is the price. This is what we charge. We do a professional job and it's, it's a service. Uh, you don't expect the, your uh, automotive repair guy, hey, can you, can you repair my car free this first time and I'll see if I'll use you in the future. It doesn't work that way. Uh, can you give me a free haircut and I'll see if I want to use you again. Uh, no, don't sell yourself short. This is, this is your business, you're a professional, and you're working for a profit, hopefully. Uh, I know some guys that do sharpen for charity, but uh, that's a different topic. Uh, but charge what you're worth. Make sure you know what your budget is. Uh, make sure you know what your yearly budget is, so that you know what your monthly budget is, so that you know what your weekly budget is, so that you know what your daily budget is. And then you know what you have to charge for the work that you're going to do. Uh, I charged a different price. If I didn't have to take a shear apart, as opposed to a shear that you had to disassemble. Uh, now you're going to have your, your oddball things like the, the cigar uh, cutter. Well, that was just an amazing, it was a fun job trying to figure out how to sharpen it all up. And um, I was pleased to hear the customer was very satisfied with it. So I hope that helps. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I'll hang out here for just a second more and see if we get some more questions uh, coming through. Um, Simon, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, he's asking about a uh, demonstration on the comb side of a thinner. Um, if you'll shoot me an email, my email is Caleb, and that's C-A-L-E-B, 
at wolfind.com. I'll send you some videos that we have done on that topic and some timestamps and see if that answers your question in the immediate uh, because that um, that is something maybe we can look at again in, in future um, streams. And on that note, um, send me an email with your suggestions of things that you would like to see. Uh, the topics we covered today, um, the diamond wheel, the medical shears, how to expand your B2B business, um, all of these topics came from emails that I received um, from um, from y'all watching this stream. So that's that's exciting. We're glad that we're able to be able to present topics that you're wanting to hear about. So so please keep them coming, sending me emails. Um, like Simon there, uh, drop them in the chat. We, we monitor the chat. We keep a look at it. We go back and look at previous streams to, to pull content from, and we're glad to be able to, to show you, show you what we can show you. Um, it looks like on the stream we're, I mean, we're a good, a good bit behind. Um, so what we'll do is we'll kind of leave the stream up and running, um, and we'll stay in the chat and answer any questions that may come up here in the last few minutes. Um, to wrap it up, I do want to talk a little housekeeping of what the, the stream is going to look at going forwards. Uh, we've been doing this on the last day, of, you know, the last Monday of the month. Next month, uh, we're getting in close to the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to skip next month. So we're not going to have a stream in November. Our next stream is going to be in December. But to also stay away from the Christmas holidays, we're going to move it up a few weeks. Our next stream is going to be on December 7th. It is a Monday. It will be at the same time that we have been doing it, um, but it, our next stream will be December 7th. So make sure uh, to mark that on your calendar. I will also send out emails. Uh, we'll po I'll post in the, the Sharpers chat group. Um, we'll post on Facebook, that kind of thing, as, as we get closer. Also want to mention um, next month, uh, since we're not having another stream, I won't get another chance to talk about this, we are going to be running Black Friday specials um, on our website. And probably very similar to what we've done in the past. For those of you who have, have bought a machine from us in the past on, on Black Friday, keep an eye out. So go, go to our website. There should be a little pop-up that comes up that asks you to put in your email address to get added to the list. Uh, go ahead and do that. Or scroll to the bottom, very bottom of the website and you can put your email address in. The email is going to be the primary way that we're going to keep you updated with the promotions that we're going to be running for Black Friday. I don't have a ton of details to give you right now on what those specials are going to be, but they're they're going to be pretty cool. We're excited about it. Um, so sign up for the emails if you're not, so you can get alerted on that um, for sure. Um, next stream, uh, we don't have a topic, so we have some ideas that we're working to. So drop us a drop us a comment in there, like Simon. Uh, shoot me an email. Once again, it's Caleb at WolfIND.com, and we will see when we can. Uh, fit your idea into the schedule. Cool. Well, uh, that's going to be it for us uh, this month. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again on December 7th. We're going to leave the, the last tile card up for a little bit so we can answer questions in the chat as they come through. But thanks. See you next time.